So thank you very much for the introduction. And um, thank you also for inviting me here to speak today. And also thank you to all you guys for coming and spending your Wednesday night listening to Ben and I talk. And I hope that it is worth it at the end of the evening. At least get a few pints in and then you'll hopefully enjoy yourself. And you're probably starting to realize about now that you signed up to come to a talk on regenerative medicine and you've just arrived at a talk that's all about hair. And it will make sense, hopefully, towards the end of my talk. Uh, I will say I'm a little bit hair-centric. All of the research in my lab does revolve around the hair follicle. And you obviously have hair fibers that exit the skin surface. They are the end product of the hair follicle. Inside the skin, underneath the skin, you have a very complex and dynamic system that controls how those hair fibers come out, whether they're curly, whether they're straight, whether they're brown or blonde, and uh, when they fall out, how long they grow for. It's all controlled deep down in the skin, in the hair follicle. Now, the bit of the hair follicle that my lab focuses on is this bit here, which is known as the dermal papilla. So this picture here is actually the base of the hair follicle. It's a very thin section that was taken through uh, a human hair follicle, and we stained it with different antibodies to highlight different proteins in the skin. So the different colors represent different proteins that are expressed in the hair follicle. And what actually happens is the dermal papilla, which is kind of enveloped by these arms here, actually signals to the surrounding tissue and tells it to keratinize and tells it to make a hair. So then when the hair comes out of the skin, it's obviously a keratinized product. But under the skin, it's not at all keratinized. It looks a bit like this. And so why did I get into hair in the first place? Well, when I left school, I knew I was interested in medicine and medical research, but I didn't want to be a doctor. And so I decided to go to Durham to do an undergraduate degree in natural sciences. And when I was there, I went to a series of really inspiring lectures by a professor called Colin Yehoda. And he taught me all about skin and hair and why it's a really great model system to understand aspects of human development. And so I decided to stay at Durham and I joined Colin's lab uh, to do a PhD. So my PhD wasn't really in hair development, even though I joined the lab to focus on that, I actually worked more on hair shedding and hair loss and different hair loss conditions. Uh, but at the end of 2007, I got my doctorate. I got to dress up in a nice fancy outfit. That's me, by the way. And uh, I also got to meet Bill Bryson, who was the chancellor of the university at the time, although his outfit, as you can see, is much fancier than mine. Uh, I'm not jealous. Um, <coughs> so at the end of 2007, I convinced my fiancé that we should move to America. And I said, let's go there so I can go for two years to study at a university over there. And I managed to convince him. And we moved in 2007, packed our bags, and moved to New York. You'd think that would be easy to convince someone to do, but it wasn't. Uh, anyway, we moved to New York, and I joined the Department of Dermatology at Columbia University. Uh, I met a lot of interesting people when I was there, and I researched hair development and also genetic disorders of the hair and skin. And research takes a lot longer than you might expect. So two years came, two years went, six years later we moved back to the UK. And then that was in fall 2013, and at the beginning of 2014 I joined the faculty at Imperial. So I have a small lab at Imperial, and all of my lab focuses on researching uh, the hair and the skin. There's a common theme here. And they, the people in my lab, uh, we are also recruiting at the moment actually, uh, the people in my lab um, research or use the skin and the hair as a model to understand human development, to understand how stem cells work, to understand the response of <coughs> tissues to traumatic injury, and also just general uh, wound healing responses. I'm also a lecturer, and I teach third and fourth years a course on tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. And you're probably starting to think about now, what on earth does hair have to do with tissue engineering and regenerative medicine? And hopefully by the end of my talk, I will have convinced you that it has everything to do with tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, and that it is an indispensable tool to use for uh, researching regenerative processes in humans in a lab setting. OK, so what's the problem? Why do we want to research regenerative medicine? Well, in the UK, every year there's about 7,000 people who are on a transplant waiting list waiting for an organ donation. The majority of these are waiting for a kidney, 
and about 3,000 of these people will actually receive a donation. So 2,000 of them will receive a kidney or a lung or whatever they're waiting for from a deceased donor. 1,000 will receive a kidney or a lung from a living donor. Uh, the problem isn't just in the UK, it's obviously in every country, and in the bigger the country, the bigger the problem. In 2013, in the United States, more than 110,000 people were actually waiting for an organ transplant. And that one of the problems with organ transplants is if someone says, oh, I've got a kidney, you can have my kidney, it's not really that straightforward. You have to find someone who is an immunological match, and that's a, bi a big problem. It's very difficult to do that. And so imagine if we could, if someone was waiting for a kidney, if we could take cells from their skin or perhaps somewhere in their body, send them off to a laboratory, grow them in the lab and turn them into a kidney, and then transplant that kidney back into the person who donated the cells. And that's tissue engineering. And that would be an autologous transplant, so it would be immunologically compatible, and the person wouldn't reject the kidney because it was made out of their own cells. But even better, imagine if you could actually just inject the person who had the defective kidney with cells or a drug or a scaffold or, or something that would enable regeneration of their kidney in situ. So they wouldn't even have to send off their cells to a lab and get a kidney made. They could just regenerate the tissue in their body. And that concept really gave rise to the field of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Uh, the, the phrase tissue engineering was first coined in 1987 and the tag regenerative medicine was added on to the end of it about 10 or 15 years later. And it really, the field really arose as a, a strategy to alleviate the need for organ donation. There's three R's in tissue engineering, the three therapeutic principles, and they are replacement, obviously straightforward replacement of a, an organ, uh, repair, and regeneration. Do you want coffee? And um, regeneration is highlighted in red because that is what I am going to be focusing on in my talk today. Sorry. Okay, so what is regeneration? Well, regeneration is when a tissue is injured. <laughs> I can't compete with that. Regeneration is when a tissue is injured, but it regrows itself <coughs> entirely so that it regains both its original form and its original function. And we do see regeneration in nature, so we can learn from nature. Uh, the most common forms, oh, this is the bad bit. Um, it is a cartoon. Um, the most common forms of regeneration are seen in uh, lower vertebrates, like salamanders, newts, and lizards. So you can chop off a lizard's tail, and it will regenerate uh, within a few months. You c this, uh, this video here is by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and in this video, we're looking at newt limb regeneration. So they chop off the newt's arm, and in a period of about two months, that arm will regrow entirely so that it regains its original form and its original function as you can see here and it re and the nerves grow back the blood vessels grow back the skin grows back and it's just the same as before and you can chop off that arm and it will regrow as many times as you can stomach chopping off the newt's arm so you can see the video of it actually happening here uh, so this little chappy on the right is a salamander, and they are amazing. They have re real regenerative potential. Not only can they regenerate their limbs if you amputate them, but they can also regenerate uh, spinal cords, their brain, their eyes, their kidney, their heart. They're re really amazing. Um, now, the problem is that humans don't regenerate. If you chop off a human's arm or a human's leg, obviously it doesn't grow back, as you can see here. And actually, with humans, we normally get scar formation instead of regeneration. Our bodies repair themselves, and it's possibly an adaptation that we want to heal quickly rather than have a slow regenerative process. So when we have an injury or a wound to any tissue or organ in our body, rather than regenerate slowly, the body heals quickly, it repairs itself, but in the process of repairing itself, it forms scar tissue. And scar tissue is not just a cosmetic problem, it's a functional problem. The presence of scar tissue can impact um, 
the ability of a tissue to function normally. So scar tissue in the skin, uh, this is uh, this girl here. Um, scar tissue in the skin is obviously doesn't have the elasticity of normal skin. Scar tissue doesn't have hair follicles, it doesn't have sweat glands. It's more like a living bandage rather than a functional skin. And actually you see scar formation after wounding in many different tissues. So if you have a heart attack, your cardiomyocytes that would normally uh, contract and enable the heart to pump blood around the body, they get replaced with scar fibroblasts and that impacts the function of the heart. If you have a stroke, you get a glial scar in your brain. If you have a spinal cord injury, you get a scar in your spinal cord. So even if the motor neurons are there, they cannot fire across the gap. And so the presence of a scar, which we get when we repair structures, disrupts tissue function. Whereas if we could regenerate a tissue structure, it would regain its form and its function and there would be no scar. So that is not all doom and gloom. There are a couple of tissues in humans that do actually regenerate. And the most common one that people know about is the liver. So it has a very well-known regenerative capacity. You might know about this um, Greek mythology legend uh, this guy called Prometheus, he was a trickster god, and he tried to outwit Zeus by stealing fire from mankind. And as a punishment, Zeus chained him to a rocky um, outcrop in the mountains. And every day, an uh, eagle would come down and feast on his liver. And the eagle would go away, and every night, the legend is that his liver would regenerate. So then the day after, the eagle would come down and eat his liver again. So it was an eternal punishment uh, because his liver was continually regrowing. And actually, your livers do regenerate. So we don't know if the Greeks were onto something when they uh, came up with this uh, legend or whether they just chose the liver and it was more luck than judgment that they chose the one tissue that does actually regenerate. Now, we don't know if... Um, Sorry, the liver can regenerate. You can actually amputate up to about 75% of your liver and it will regrow, not overnight and obviously not if you have too many pints or attend too many pint of science events, uh, but it will regrow and it will regrow so it regains its original function. Now, if you want to study human regeneration or regenerative processes in humans, livers are obviously quite difficult to get hold of and a much more accessible tissue, you know where I'm going with this, is the hair follicle. And people don't know this, but the hair follicle actually does regenerate as well. The liver regenerates, but so does the hair follicle. And this is a hair follicle here. You can amputate off the bottom of the hair follicle. This region is the dermal papilla that I was talking about at the beginning. And over a course of a couple of weeks, your hair follicle will regrow. It will be slightly smaller, but it will still have the same form that it had originally, and it will regain its function, and its function is to make a hair fiber. That's the end product, right? So if you amputate a hair follicle, it will repair itself completely scarlessly over the course of about two weeks. So in essence, it will regenerate itself. And this means that the hair follicle is a highly accessible model system with which to study regenerative processes in human tissues. And so that's exactly what we do in our lab. And we get a lot of human skin from different sources. Um, skin is kind of the root into your body. And so if you're having some sort of surgery, often your skin gets cut and a bit of it will get discarded as a byproduct of that surgery. And so obviously this is all approved by the Human Tissue Authority and we get ethical consent from patients, uh, but they can donate leftover tissues when they're having other procedures done. And so this is an example of the type of skin that we might get in the lab. This is actually um, occipital scalp skin. It's taken from the back of the head. On the top here, you, you can see this is the outside and this is the inside of the body. So on the top here, you have the epidermis and this is the skin barrier. This keeps pathogens out and it also keeps kind of solutes and water and everything in your body so you stay hydrated. Uh, this epidermis contains many different cell types, melanocytes, which provide pigment, and keratinocytes, which make up the bulk of the epidermis. Now, underneath the epidermis, you have this stromal matrix here, which is really a supportive tissue to the functional epidermis, and that is, contains cells, which are called dermal fibroblasts, and also blood vessels and nerves. Now, underneath the dermis, we have this layer here, 
which is called dermal white adipose tissue, or fat, as it's more commonly known. Um, your hair fibers obviously exit the skin's surface, but the hair fibers are encapsulated in these hair follicles. So you can see that the hair fiber goes all the way down here, and surrounding it in this kind of concentric matrix is this hair follicle, which supports the hair fiber's growth. Then at the bottom of the hair follicle, it's all controlled by this dermal papilla, which is the epicenter of the follicle. And I've got it here. This, this is the picture from the first slide, because it's a bit small to see the dermal papilla in this picture. But the dermal papilla is here. And signals from the dermal papilla tell all these cells around them to come together and keratinize and make this hair fiber, which then goes on and moves out the hair surface. And so this is what we research. Um, or this is what we obtain, this type of sample. So obviously, this is adult skin. When you're developing in the embryo, your skin does not look like this. Actually, it's very unipotent. You have a single-layered epidermis, and you have a very simple dermis that underlies it. So you kind of have a structure like this. And your hair follicles arise through a process known as uh, secondary induction. Induction is an interaction between one tissue and inducing tissue, and that inducing tissue is the dermis. And another tissue, a responding tissue, this case it's the epidermis, as a result of which the epidermis changes its fate. So in response to a signal from the dermis, the epidermis will no longer be skin, but it will differentiate into either a hair or a nail, a feather, mammary gland, or a tooth, or where, depending on where it is on the body, or depending on the zoological class in the case of a feather. Actually, we know that the signal arises within the dermis because of a series of elegant uh, recombination experiments that were done back in the 1970s by Daniel Dwally and Philip Sangal. And actually, these were the experiments that Colin Yehoda spoke about in his lectures, which is why I decided to enter this field and study the wonderful world of hair. Uh, so in these experiments, they actually took both mice and, and chickens and other uh, species prior to them developing either feathers or hair. And they took dermis and they took skin from hair-bearing sites, such as the dorsal skin, and non-hair-bearing sites, such as the palms. And then they used an enzyme to separate the dermis and epidermis in these pieces of skin. And so once they had separated the epidermis and dermis, they recombined them in different combinations. When they recombined dermis from a hair-bearing site, with epidermis from a non-hair-bearing site, because the dermis is where the signal comes from to initiate hair development, that dermis was still able to signal to the non-hairy epidermis, and they got hair follicles developing. However, when they did the reverse combination, and they recombined non-hair-bearing dermis from a non-hair-bearing site, like the palms planter skin, with a hair-forming epidermis, even though we knew that the epidermis was capable of making hair, it comes from a hair-bearing site, it didn't make hair because there was no signal telling it to turn into a hair because there was no signal coming from the non-hairy dermis. So the, at the end of these experiments, they concluded that hair follicle development arises uh, with the initiating signal for the process arise, uh, coming from the dermis. So wine or water? I'll have water. So actually, so this is the process of hair follicle development. You start off with this unipotent epidermis and dermis. This is the epidermis. You can see the epithelial keratinocytes. Uh, they're the round cartoon-like cells. Uh, this is the dermis, and that contains these cells' dermal fibroblasts. There is a signal from the dermis that stimulates the overlying epidermis. We don't know what the signal is, even though, even though the experiments were done in the 1970s. We still don't know what the signal is. And that signal causes these epithelial cells to kind of thicken, and you get regular spacings or spaced thickenings in the epidermis, which are known as placodes. And this is where the hair follicle will actually form. The placode then sends a signal back down into the dermal fibroblasts. And as a result of this signal, the cells migrate towards the placode. And they double in density. And they kind of 
cluster or condense and they start to become known as the dermal condensate. When they get there, they actually switch on expression of proteins and genes that are associated with a hair follicle fate. So they're becoming committed and they're becoming <coughs> part of the hair follicle once they get to the condensate. Now the condensate then sends a third signal, again we don't know what the signal is, um, up to the placode and as a result of this signal, the placode cells start dividing. So instead of one you get two, then four, then eight and they need to go somewhere. So they push down into the skin, into the dermis and they first form the hair germ, later they form the hair peg and eventually they push down so far that they form the hair follicle. And you can see that the condensate that we've seen here starts to become engulfed by this epithelial tissue pushing down into the skin. And eventually, we have a completely engulfed condensate, which becomes known as the dermal papilla. Now, the dermal condensate that you see during development becomes the dermal papilla of the adult hair follicle. And actually, in the adult, your hairs go through these continuous cycles of growth and degeneration and regeneration throughout their lifetime. So the growth phase is known as anagen, and that is when your hair fiber is actively growing. So obviously hair on your head has a very long anagen, hair on your eyebrows or your eyelashes has a relatively short anagen. And then the follicles move and they go into the regression phase of the cycle. And so the length of anagen dictates the length of the hair fiber that is produced. So the follicle goes into this regression phase catagen and then a resting phase telogen. At the end of telogen, the hair fiber falls out, it's no longer growing, and the hair follicle needs to get back into anagen. And so actually, it's thought that signals from the dermal papilla will stimulate the overlying epithelial tissue, which is now known as the bulge, just in the same way that the condensate stimulated the placode during development. And these epithelial cells will start to divide, and they'll push down, and the follicle will go back into anagen. So we see a kind of we can use adult hair follicles and the signals that, and the interactions between the dermal papilla and the epithelium to understand about aspects of hair follicle development. So the dermal condensate is crucial for development. If you um, irradiate hair follicles so the condensate disperses and the cells are no longer aggregated together, hair follicle development will be completely arrested. And in the adult, if you took follicles that were in the resting phase telogen, you can see here, here's the epithelium, here's the dermal papilla, and you ablated the dermal papilla, this was done with a laser, and they ablated these dermal papillae, the follicle gets stuck in telogen because the dermal papilla is no longer present and signaling to the epithelium, telling it it needs to go back into its growth phase. Whereas when the dermal papilla is present, the follicle can re-go, re-enter anagen. So just as the condensate is critical for hair follicle development, the papilla is crucial for hair follicle cycling. Now we're really interested in the dermal papilla, and this is the reason why. You can actually take skin and you can isolate out the dermal papilla. You, you essentially chop off this end bulb region here, and if you imagine a kind of sock with something in, inside it, if you invert the sock, uh, that something will fall out, and that's essentially what we do. We invert the end bulb and the dermal papilla pops out. And you can isolate these dermal papillae and you can transplant them into, now this was actually a, a person's forearm, um, or into amputated follicles and they behave like the condensate did during development. They retain some element of their uh, kind of inductive potency. And this intact papillae will tell that epidermis that it's been placed against to differentiate and form a hair follicle on that site. So this hair fiber is the product of a hair follicle that it was induced by transplanting an intact dermal papillae, and that's really amazing. You can also take these cells and you can place them into a dish. This is the papillae that was placed into the dish here, and after about a week, the papillae will collapse and the cells will migrate out of it. And you can see them growing out in this kind of star-shaped conformation here. And uh, this is known as a cell culture. When the cells fill the dish, they don't like it. They like to be separated, so they have more space. So you can use enzymes to lift them up and separate them into multiple dishes, as you can see here. And so you can passage your dermal papilla cells. But the problem comes 
when you grow your dermal papilla cells like this, they lose their capacity to induce hair growth in recipient tissues. And so part of my postdoc work was trying to work out why that was. And I have like two slides here, and I'm going to show you five years' worth of work, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, so essentially, we started generating a genetic or gene transcriptional profiles of dermal papilla cells in different stages. And so these are the profiles. I'll go through them and explain them now. And we have intact papillae cells at early culture and later stages in culture. So these plots here represent uh, genes that are expressed at different levels in different cell states. So each uh, grid represents the tissue above. And if you can see, there's actually smaller nodes within the grids. There's, this is a 25 by 26 grid. So there's 650 little squares in each of these larger squares. And these nodes contain genes that are expressed in, at different levels. So if we look at a node up here on the left, it will contain genes that are expressed at very low levels in intact papillae, but they increase in expression when you culture the cells, and they stay high when you have the cells in culture. Whereas this kind of area of the plot, uh, genes are expressed at very high levels in the dermal papillae, as indicated by the red color. When you culture the cells, the same genes decrease in expression, and they remain relatively low. So we started to hypothesize that perhaps the kind of architecture and three-dimensional structure of the papillae actually was related to its inductive capacity because these cells are inductive and these cells cannot induce hair growth in recipient skin. And so we used a method uh, known, known as hanging drop culture. We grew the cells in these hanging drops and it essentially forced them to come together into these little, well, the, they look large here, but they're about half the size of that. So these little aggregates or these little spheroids. And we said, perhaps these are like dermal condensates that we would see during development. We're forcing the cells together. And actually, if you look at the genetic profile, you can see that there are many similarities between the dermal spheroids and the dermal papilla cells. And I'll highlight the areas here. So genes that are expressed at high levels in the dermal papillae, sorry, low levels in the intact papillae, high levels in culture, decrease again when you grow them in dermal spheroids. Genes that are expressed at high levels in the intact papillae, low levels in culture, increase again when you grow the cells in dermal spheroids. And so the next obvious thing for us to do, if we had restored the kind of genetic expression profile of our dermal cells by putting them into this three-dimensional condensate structure, would they be inductive? Uh, so this is how we grow the cells. This is a, a Petri dish, and you can see the hanging drops on the top of the plate. And the cells literally uh, come together over the course of a couple of days and form these aggregates. And when we transplanted these into um, human skin to look to see whether they were inductive, Sure enough, the dermal papilla spheroids, but not the cells, were able to induce hair follicle formation in the recipient skin. And so you can see here, here's a newly formed dermal papillae, and here's the epidermis up here. So they're relatively small hair follicles, but by simply growing our dermal papilla cells in an aggregation and forcing them to condensate, we were essentially restoring their inductive function or their identity, which is to instruct hair growth. Now, can all cells that are grown in the spheroid conformation induce hair? And the answer is no. If we grew, dermal, if we grew fibroblasts, which are also found in the skin, in a hanging drop to form a spheroid, and we transplanted them, we did not see hairs, which means that the structure, the condensate structure, whilst it is necessary for hair follicle development, it's not sufficient because not all cells growing in a condensate will instruct hair growth. So I've shown you that the condensed mesenchyme, the dermal papillae, is required for both hair follicle development and hair follicle cycling, and more recently for hair follicle induction. So we can use a dermal papillae, an in, a condensed dermal papillae, to regenerate a hair follicle structure. Now, actually, 
even though dermal fibroblasts, when they were condensed into this spheroid structure, were not able to induce hair growth, we do see a condensed mesenchyme preceding the development of many other tissues, not just hair follicles. So you see condensed mesenchyme uh, preceding the development of perhaps obvious tissues like mammary gland or teeth. But we also see condensed mesenchyme preceding tissue development in liver, in lungs, in the kidney, in cartilage. And so if we can try to understand what's unique about the papillae and distinguishes it from fibroblasts and what's unique about the condensate structure and how that condensate structure in the papillae forms normally during development, we can apply these lessons to learn about other systems, such as cartilage or kidneys or lungs, where condensed mesenchyme drives development of those tissues, um, which is essentially that. Um, so I've shown you that the need for replacement organs and tissues has given rise to the field of tissue, en of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Regeneration often occurs in species such as salamanders and newts, although in humans we often get repair rather than regeneration. So the um, tissue regeneration is limited, previously it was thought it was limited only to the liver. It is also found in the hair follicle. The mechanisms of follicle development and regeneration are apprised in the development of several other tissues where a condensed mesenchyme controls growth. So studying hair follicle development and regeneration can give us insight into these regenerative processes that can theoretically be applied to generate new tissues and control growth in a lab setting. How am I doing for time? Is it? Yep, okay. So I was, I, when I practiced my talk earlier, it was like 50 minutes. And so I took all of this stuff out, but I thought I'll put it on the last slide in case there's time. So one other thing to, a take home message about the hair follicle is that not only is it accessible that you can get skin, but it's visual, so you don't even need to get skin. You can just look at a patient and you can understand what's going on in their hair follicles. So obviously, actually these, this patient here, this mouse, this is a rabbit, if you can't tell, it's a little face. Uh, they all share a mutation in the same gene that, called FGF5 that has resulted in their hair follicles getting stuck in the growth phase. Their hair follicles will not enter the degeneration phase. And so we don't, all we need is some saliva or a blood sample from these patients and we can analyze them. And you can see the phenotype is so visual, you don't even need to, to get tissue samples. So the hair is a really great model because you can analyze changes in the hair follicle in real time by just looking at people um, to try to understand the genes and the proteins that are involved in both hair follicle development and hair follicle cycling. So hopefully that is your take home message. Um, I'd like to thank all the people who work in my lab, uh, clinical collaborators and academic collaborators, and obviously everyone who pays the bills. And thank you very much to Pint of Science. Thank you. And thank you. So how do you have to re-implant the follicle, uh, or sorry, the pillar into the crack into the dermis? And how do you think you can then um, so, so actually we re-implanted it, we, we just had skin and we used an enzyme to separate the epidermis and dermis. We placed the dermal papilla and then put it back together a bit like a sandwich. Um, but actually people are developing kind of rollers with spikes on them to, to be able to roll them onto people's heads um, at the moment. You do have to get the papillae so it's touching the epidermis. If you pushed it in too deep, you wouldn't get any hair follicle development. There needs to be communication between the two compartments. Um, now applying, we're not going to use hair follicle dermal papillae to regenerate um, a liver, but there's a, a lot of questions that we don't know. So one of the big questions is when the placode sends out a signal to the dermis and it gets the cells to come in, do the cells that are just closest to the placode come in and then they get changed? Uh, so that would be a, a kind of conditional fate. So in response to the signal, they turn into condensate cells or are there cells that are predetermined to form the condensate that are capable of responding to that signal? 
and depending on whether it's a predetermined or a conditional uh, response will determine how we go forward because we would assume that perhaps it's the same. If it's a conditional response, we just need to work out what the signal is that promotes condensate formation, right? And then we can promote condensate formation in a bone or, or a liver and or a lung and get that tissue to grow because it's the presence of the condensate that initiates tissue development. If it's predetermined, it's more difficult um, and we would have to kind of reprogram cells so they became capable of responding to the signal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, we just need to work out first how it works and then you can apply it to that's the easy. other systems. <laughs> yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah. What is the current state of the art in um, hair regeneration? Is it like you're saying um, growth factor stimulation or is it um, cell implant? It's cell implants, yeah, because if you, there's something unique about the papillae, we don't know why, but if you grow dermal fibroblasts in a spheroid, they don't induce hair growth. And you can, I mean, you can take drugs and put them on the skin and hair will grow, but the papilla is always present. No one's actually looked at if the papilla wasn't present and you didn't have that structure there, whether the drugs would be able to do anything. So I think the drugs somehow, in combination with the structure of the papillae, uh, promote growth. But so that's for hair regeneration. All drugs that were discovered for hair growth were discovered serendipitously. No one's ever discovered a drug that actually just makes hair grow. They've all been found when people have been taking a drug for something else and they got hair growth as a side effect. Uh, so we've, and we don't know how a lot of these drugs even work. Um, they just make hair grow, <laughs> that's all we know. Uh, but yeah, I think um, transplant is the way forward. But when we made hair with our dermal papillae spheroids, they were really small and they were unpigmented. Uh, so they, they weren't like scalp hair. Uh, so, and we only partially, I don't, you couldn't really see from the genetic signatures, but we partially restored the genetic signature. We didn't fully restore it. And we think that there is there's other signals that we need to perhaps add on to the spheroid to result in full restoration of the signature, and then perhaps then we'll get a better hair follicle or hair fiber growing. Okay. Is there research you want to understand what the signals are, or is it proper, or is it just not much more because you're looking at the other, the other? No, no, there's lo loads of research, and everyone has their pathway, right, that they, they work on, um, which they, they focus on. There's a about five main key pathways that are really involved and probably interact together. Uh, but people tend to knock out or look at one gene at a time. And I think really it's, uh, you need to look at kind of the big picture. Um, yeah. yeah, this hair for the regeneration of the So you mentioned the lizards earlier, uh, yeah, them off and limbs off. Um, I don't know, actually. That's a really good question. Um, I was thinking about this earlier because I thought maybe someone will ask that question. Um, and I, I, I honestly don't know. When we amputate them, just to regenerate once. Uh, but then we never look at them again. Um, but on your head, like your scalp hair follicles go through that regenerative growth degeneration process probably about 20 times on your scalp and on hair like your eyebrows. I mean, they're going through it every few months. Um, I think the hair on your eyelashes grows for about two months and then it will go through the cycle and then it will, will grow again. So because it has that kind of regenerative capacity, I would hazard a guess and say, yeah, it's maybe like the newt, but I mean, I just, I don't know. But it'd be nice to know. I guess my follow-up question is that it's very similar mechanisms between the uh, new tissue generation and the no, actually, th um, there's not, in the new limb, uh, there's a lot of stem cells that come in and they form this structure called a blastoma. And then the presence of the blastoma kind of enables growth. And so we've looked for kind of blastoma-like structures in the hair follicle and we haven't found one yet. But uh, I mean, perhaps there could be one and it's just that we're in looking at human tissues and the signals that define a blastoma are maybe different, I, d I don't know. Um, in the newt limb, stem cells, like there's four different types of stem cells that will come in and enable regeneration of the, the limb itself, uh, nerve ones, blood vessel, cartilage, and skin. 
in the hair follicle, it's not the stem cells. The stem cells are actually still present if you amputate the follicle. It's the niche of the stem cells. That so all stem cells have a niche that supports their growth and maintains them in kind of an undifferentiated state. The niche is what you amputate off, and that reforms, and that controls the stem cells. So it's a little bit different, but yeah. Does that answer your question? We're going to take a 10-minute break. Okay. Uh, so please put your hands together for...